I've asked each, each of the uh, speakers to take about three minutes to tell who they are, introduce themselves, and um, let's start alphabetically. Hi, good morning. I'm Maggie Peloso. I'm a partner with Vincent and Elkins in Washington, D.C. My legal practice focuses on climate risk analysis and climate risk management in the energy and oil and gas industries. Uh, and I've been working with some of the utilities out here on wildfire issues for about the past year and a half. And you do have a Stanford connection. Yeah, I, Come on. <laughs> Maggie. I do. I got my law degree here at Stanford, and it is lovely to be back on campus. Great. I'm Mike Wara. Uh, I'm a senior research scholar at the Woods Institution, uh, Woods Institute where, at Stanford, where I also direct the climate and energy policy program. And for uh, better part of a decade, uh, I've been working closely uh, with uh, the legislature in California on climate and energy policies. We were closely involved in uh, reenactment, uh, re re uh, extension of cap and trade in California, and um, also uh, discussions around energy market regionalization, and then, of course, for the last couple of years, thinking hard about wildfire and uh, issues related to the electric utilities, um, and, and the broader set of issues involving insurance and uh, mitigation of risk. Um, most recently, I was the Senate appointee to the Commission on I'm going to try to get this name right. I think of it as just the Wildfire Commission, but the Commission on uh, Catastrophic Wildfire Cost and Recovery. Uh, we transmitted our report to the legislature and the governor yesterday, our final report, making recommendations about how to better manage uh, and socialize the costs of utility-caused catastrophic wildfire in California. Great. So, and I'm Jim Sweeney. And I'm not going to say any more about me. Um, so one of you, this is an issue on, on wildfires and electricity. How would you, one of you, a quick characterization is how do you think about what the issues of wildfire risk are? What's the, the gut few sentences that we can have in, in your characterization of what the, the issue is? Sure. Well, I think California um, is suffering from sort of a confluence of factors that have really uh, created a, a level of risk for the state that is unacceptable. Um, and among those factors, I would list uh, probably first and foremost our land use policies in the state and the, the fact that it's very hard to build uh, economically uh, in urban environments, it's much easier to build in greenfield, high wildfire risk areas. We've been doing that for the better part of 50 years. Um, we don't maintain adequate um, defensible space, and we don't really manage fuels in the areas where we do build effectively. We run, we have an antiquated uh, aging electricity system um, that is serving individuals that live in these dangerous areas, and layered on top of that, there's climate change. Um, and you combine all of those factors, and you have the potential for a real crisis. And we've had a string of years with really bad luck. Um, but, you know, it's it's just a matter of probabilities, and I, and I think we're, we're really suffering from the set of choices that we've made, and we can fix them. The good news is we can actually do better in the state. Maggie, do you want to add to that characterization or change it? I, I will add a little bit. I, I think Michael's done a really excellent job of capturing some of the broader policy problems that create this firestorm, no pun intended, um, here in the state. I think one of the really important dynamics, though, to think about is the unique liability regime that you all have in California for how utilities are treated during wildfires. So as the Blue Ribbon Commission report points out, only about 10% of the wildfires in the state are caused by utilities. But utility-caused wildfires tend to happen when the winds are really high. They happen because transmission equipment has trees blown into it or it gets knocked over. Um, and so that means that when those fires start, the conditions are really ripe for them to grow very large and spread very quickly. 
In California right now, there is a judicially created extension of the state's constitutional inverse condemnation protections, which means that utilities are held strictly liable for any fire that is caused by them. And so that means that anybody who loses their home, their property, or their business gets paid no questions asked, which is very different from how other states address liability. And I think it's just an important feature to note at the outset, because one of the many challenging dynamics that needs to be balanced as we're thinking about addressing the wildfire problem going forward, and particularly the role of utilities, is what is the financial vi viability of the utilities? And the markets have reacted very strongly to the combination of the application of inverse condemnation to the utilities and the Public Utilities Commission's decision to not allow those costs to be passed through on rates. Now, you've both laid a lot of issues on the table, and I'd like to help us unpack some of them. First, um, the magnitude of uh, these fires, and, and Mike, you call that probabilistic. Um, are these massive losses that we've had a fluke, or should we think it's going to be the new normal and plan for it to be the new normal? I think there's... Uh well, I, I spent a lot of time working with reinsurers on this issue. That the, the reinsurers are really the people that ultimately hold the wildfire risk for California, um, and they write for you know the utilities and the home insurers potentially if certain legislation passes this year for the state of California itself. So they they are the end holder of the risk, and they're working very hard to better understand the risk. And I think the reality is we don't have a good handle on how bad this could be. What is clear is that we have not yet experienced a worst case scenario, right? The worst case scenarios for loss exist in the areas around the Bay Area that have not yet burned, right? Orinda Moraga, frankly, right next to Stanford's campus, um, or Marin County. And those are places where you could easily lose $35 billion of insured value in a day. And that's, you know, that's very different than Paradise, where we lost a tremendous amount of housing. It was a terrible tragedy, but the, from a financial perspective, you know the disasters are, are are potentially urban Northern California disasters, more like the Tunnel Fire that we experienced a generation ago. Um, I do think that this is a catastrophic risk that is part of the new reality. Um, the Work being done at Stanford, uh, in particular by NOAA Diffibus Group, is working to show that hotter, drier falls are a characteristic feature of a warming California climate. And that is exactly the set of characteristics, that extended drying period into the late fall, that kind of loads the gun for catastrophic wildfire. It's the fact that it doesn't start raining on October 1st anymore, that, or there's a better chance of it not starting to rain on October 1st that creates the conditions that, that allow for hot, windy, dry conditions that blow limbs into, tree, into, into lines and start fires. So this may be the new normal. So if I understand this, just to make sure that, to underline, to make sure I haven't understood it, you said, look, there's a probability distribution about what can happen. What really can happen is so far out of the probability distribution from what we've already experienced that um, if this is, this may be the new normal, but it can be so much worse than that, and we've got to figure out how to deal with that. It, I think you said that. Mag, Maggie, do you agree with that? I do. I think that um, it is without doubt that we will experience an increase in, I'm going to say, climate-driven disasters, because I do think, while this is a wildfire panel, it's important to say this is not just a wildfire problem. You're going to see more catastrophic flooding. There are a bunch of other natural hazard kinds of problems that have climate change linkages. I think the really interesting question is, when you think about the damage as opposed to the disaster, whether we will come up with a set of public policy solutions to move people out of hazard areas or keep them from moving there in the first place. I heard some great conversation in the hallway before this panel where someone said, the problem is that Californians have moved to the fire. And that's exactly true. If you look at the development patterns, people have put themselves in harm's way. This is not just true of fires, it's true on the coast. Um, and so I think the increasing hazard events Absolutely. 
how much it's going to cost us and what the sort of societal and human costs will be, that's something we can do something about. Okay, scary. Okay, it's my bottom line there. Uh, and But I also heard you say, yeah, climate change has something to do with it, but how we're building it really has a lot to do. We've moved to the fires rather than that. Um, is is it fair that climate, to say that climate change is a part, but in, at the bottom line, probably only a small part of the fact that we have massive costs when we have fires? I don't know that I would be comfortable saying it's a small part. Um, I, I think that climate change is creating conditions where fires can get bigger, faster, and can spread more. But, you know, we also have to think about things like what is forest management policy? What does land use look like? We've, we've put ourselves in the way to get hurt. But I, I just don't know sitting here today that I would be comfortable saying how big or how small of a piece climate change is. It's certainly a factor. But if Sausalito would have burned down, it has nothing to do probably with, with the fact that there's there's brush around it has to do with houses are next to each other. Um, I, am I missing the point on this? Well, I, I think the what climate change has done is to turn a once in 400 year event into a once in 50 year event and a once in 200 year event into a once in 20 year event. And so it's certainly possible that climate change, you know, that, that Sausalito, the hillside below 101 could burn down someday in a world without climate change, um, including all the houses that are there. Um, but it's much more likely, given the evolving climate and weather situation that we confront in the state. But I would also agree with what Maggie said, which is that there's a lot we can do about this. I mean, we can stop, you know, when you're in a hole, the first thing to do is stop digging, right? <laughs> we can stop putting new people in harm's way. Of course, there's this problem that we put I don't know, you know, depending on how you count, somewhere between one and three and a half million homes in harm's way in the state. And we've got to figure out what to do about those people because just telling them to walk away from their biggest pot of investment and savings, especially if this is California we're talking about, right? People are house poor, is, is not, that's an economic disaster for the people and for the state. And, but I think there are things that we can do to make those people a lot safer you know, sort of analogous to what has happened in the Southeast in response to, you know, after Hurricane Andrew, the changed perception of risk from wind damage led to, a, you know, building requirements that basically put super roofs on everyone's house. Not, and the houses still are going to blow down if the Cat 5 or Cat, even Cat 4 comes ashore on top of your house. But they will survive a Cat 3. And we need to build a California that, you know, and especially in the wildland urban interface, that will survive the fire equivalent of a Cat 3 without causing the kind of loss and destruction and devastation that we've seen over the past two years. Okay, you, you, we've, we've suddenly changed to some now the things we get. No, 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 no. We're supposed to be changing around. That's why we're doing it in this format, so we can jump around the topics. But I want to unpack something earlier that, that Maggie talked about. The liability regime for utilities, Maggie. Could you could you just say a little bit more about um, how does uh, the regime here differ from other states? I mean, if there's a risk and houses burn down, it, it is a social cost one way or the other. But uh, tell us about a little bit more about the difference in the liability regime and. What, why it matters. Sure. So I think um, just as a threshold matter, it probably makes sense to say a few words about what happens in, in any general disaster, right? Because in, in any disaster, in a hurricane, in a fire, anything, you have utility equipment that's compromised. And so when we think about the cost of a disaster from a utility perspective, we think about first party costs and third party costs. And so the first party cost, that would be, I've got to go out and put back up my lines and poles. I've got to repair transformers. I've got to get electricity back to you. Those costs are very universally recognized as costs that get recovered in rates. In most places, those go into your rates after the fact. Uh, there are a couple of states, Florida being a leader among them, who experience frequent natural disasters and actually allow their utilities to do what's called a storm surcharge. So they charge you a couple of bucks every year and they put it in account so when the hurricane comes, they spend that money first to put poles and lines back up and then if they need more money, they'll come back in a rate proceeding. The second piece is, is the third party cost. So that's... Um, 
a storm comes and the power lines get knocked down and I start a fire and I burn your home down and now you want me to pay you. In most states, in that situation, the legal regime you're under is a negligence regime. So what that means is that you end up before court and the court is asking the question, was your conduct in operating the power system reasonable? And when you're thinking about a storm event, a high wind event that could cause a fire, those kinds of things, the kinds of questions a court will be asking is the court will be trying to balance well, gosh, were you trying to keep the fire station, the traffic lights, the hospitals, the nursing homes where you couldn't evacuate people functional? And how does that compare to whatever you did to manage the risk of starting the fire or whatever other event caused the loss? Here in California, where you have this strict liability regime, what happens instead is the moment that Cal Fire issues that report that says the utility is the root cause of the fire, that's it. Doesn't matter what else you might have been trying to do. Doesn't matter if you were diligent or negligent in the maintenance of your lines and your other equipment. You just have to pay for it all. Now, that in and of itself would not necessarily be a huge problem. In fact, the decision that extended the doctrine of inverse condemnation to the utilities, I think, was trying to do something very elegant and saying, this is a way to socialize a cost that, that an individual has borne across the ratepayer base, right? So that the people who are benefiting from the electric service are going to jointly share in the cost of these utility caused fires. The problem is that when this theory really got tested after the witch fire, when sdg &E tried to get rate recovery, the Public Utility Commission stepped in and they said, well, you know what, we can only pass on costs that are prudent. And normally we have a prudency review happen before you like build a new transmission line. You say, well, is this really needed? And so they were trying to figure out how to graft prudency review onto this post hoc review of fire costs. And that's really challenging because right now we don't have a framework, though it's evolving a bit with the wildfire management plans, that says, like, here's the blueprint. And if you can show me before the fire you did A, B, C, and D, and I can check all those things off the list, you were prudent and you get to pass those costs on. So instead, the regime we're under now, you're just, you look facially imprudent because the fire happened, right? There clearly was an extra limb that could have been trimmed or something else, or otherwise you wouldn't have had the fire. So functionally what happens is that the utilities are finding themselves in a position where they have to bear the full cost of the fire, and there is nothing in that structure that accounts for how diligent you were or were not in trying to prevent wildfires. And as Michael said, you know, we're moving into a regime where the fires are inevitable. And so that creates a lot of challenges in thinking about how you're going to have financially solvent utilities that will be able to continue to deliver power in the state of California. Well, if all the other states... Can I comment on that, Jim? Sure. <laughs> Good. Okay. Go. Go so for it. So I think it's... I think I agree with almost everything that Maggie said, although I think I would put a slightly different nuance on it. I, I completely agree that, you know, the inverse condemnation framework that we have in the state is totally anomalous um, with respect to the rest of the United States. And that the, the, the San Diego decision, the, the decision where cost recovery was denied, really shook the markets and, and, and shook the market confidence that we frankly need in order to be able to invest and put steel in the ground in California in the paradigm, the regulatory paradigm in California. I would argue, though, that I, I think there may have been you know, a, a, a bit of a market overreaction. Um, you know, we have one decision on this issue in the state. One. There's never been another cost recovery application for a fire because the fires were never big enough to exceed the general liability policies of the utilities prior to that fire in 2007. Now, we have a bunch more fires subsequently that are big enough to exceed the general liability coverage, obviously. Um, but I think the con drawing the conclusion that California is never going to allow the cost to be socialized, that they will always be borne by the utilities is kind of a bridge too far. Um, and in a, I, I think there are steps that can be taken and, and, and the legislature and the governor, the previous governor, have tried to take some steps and I imagine over the next month or so we're going to take a few more to try to create some confidence without overcorrecting. Right, without kind of guaranteeing that no matter what happens, ratepayers are on the hook. Because the reality is, in California, we have some utilities with some pretty serious safety culture problems. And that cannot be taken out of this equation. Right? We've got PG E where, you know, I, I mean I could I could go on and on, but there's a there's a cultural issue at the company that needs to be fixed in order for there to be trust between the the state and the management of the utility, that things are being done right.
And, and so navigating that is, is, is tricky business. It's not so simple, I think, as just um, changing a rule to make the markets happy. I've got a simple-minded view of this, and tell me what's wrong with this. Um, the only reason utilities move electricity on transmission lines is because people want to buy that electricity. If nobody wanted to buy electricity, you wouldn't move any in the lines. And because people want multiple nines, they want it to be really secure and never turned off. Is it then the why should it be the customer's responsibility for the cost of uh, any damages? Because it's only the customers of electricity that cause electricity to be moved. That's maybe too simple-minded, but what's wrong with that? <clears throat> I know well, lots I think, of things. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's called the pregnant pause. <laughs> Sorry. Do you want to go first? Do you want me to go first? You can go. Okay. First. I, I mean, I think you know we, we we have regulated monopolies providing an essential service. Um, I, there's there's no doubt that, uh, and 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 there's a general kind of policy in the design of rates that that we don't um, kind of subdivide rate structures um, excessively. You know, one proposal kind of off the cuff that President Picker made in the early days of all of this was, well, we should just have a wildfire zone rate where we charge the people who live in the wildfire zones the full cost uh, that they cause by choosing to live there. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, people, if, if that happened, you'd have a lot of generators. I mean, that's the, you know, the real answer is there are options that people have. And actually... I just read a report that said that interest in gas generators is up 600% this season in California. In the, and it's because of this, this, this decreasing reliability. An alternative, I think, would be to price reliability um, and, and to try to think about, you know, we, we, you pointed out, we want the three nines or four nines. Um, we assume that that's free and we don't offer um, products that are differentiated by the quality of service, and that that might be an alternative option, um, you know, that that would allow consumers to make um, choices. Countering that is the thought that some consumers are more able to make those choices than others, um, and yeah. Okay, so. yeah, and you pause in a different way, Maggie. Do you want to <laughs> do you want to add or subtract or more of that? I mean, I, th I think those those points are all spot on. I, I think that, though, implicit in your question was was a bit of a who who's causing the problem and who should who should bear the risk because of their their contribution to it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, and I think it is important to remember that very large portions of this country were not electrified until the middle of the last century, right? That's why we have things like the Rural Electric Cooperatives Act. So this is really kind of a modern societal construct that we all expect to just be able to walk into any room and flip a light switch and the light comes on. And there are a lot of complicated things that have to happen to make that happen on a reliable basis. And, you know, I think that one of the things that's tricky about thinking about, you know, who, who should really be bearing those costs, right? Sure, the individual consumers are consuming electricity, and that's what, why we need to put electrons through lines. But where we need to put the lines is because of where we're choosing to build, right? And I think that if you're really trying to get at how you're going to address the, the risk conversation, while demand reduction may be part of it, um, I think that a much larger part of it is thinking about how are you designing communities, right? We have all these conversations now about smart communities and EV charging and all those kinds of things. And one of the pieces that's often missing from those conversations is how are we thinking about hazard risk exposure and, and how we're designing communities for hazard risk exposure. Okay, let's expand on that. Um, one of the phrases we've already heard today is resilience. And it, it would seem that, you know, there's... One view you can take is fires, if you live in a rural wooded area, you know, fires happen. And the, you can build communities so they're resilient and some that aren't. If you want resilience, you never build a community that has only one, one road in and out. But you also make sure you have, have defensible spaces and you figure out construction standards. So fire can just wipe over the community without burning it down and killing. Why, why aren't we going in that direction? Or are we? Uh, 
Okay. I, I, I was going to say, you know, I think, I think, you know, the, Jim, all these questions are pushing on a basic issue, which is how much does this cost and who's going to pay for it? And it is certainly possible to build resilient communities. I think there, there's a wonderful article about the Montecito Fire Con Protection District. Montecito is a very affluent place. If you've ever been there, it's nice. Um, they, the community funded uh, several full-time employees to work full-time for a better part of a decade before the Thomas fire hit on improving the fire resilience of the community. And they made a lot of progress such that when the Thomas fire came down the hill at Montecito, it basically stopped. It burned, I think, three houses down within the community. And it was coming at that. And then they had some time. They had some time to get ready. They had a day to get ready. But, but the real preparation began years before. But the, the challenge, I think, at the state level is not everyone lives in Montecito. And, and the willingness to pay taxes and fees to support those kinds of investments is, is I think, um, you know, something we need to have an honest conversation about. Uh, because one way or another, we're going to pay for them. And, and I guess my view would be it's much better to pay for them up front in terms of investment and mitigation than it is to pay for them on the back end, paying to, you know, re-prop up financially distressed utilities to try to find a way to keep, you know, help people rebuild through emergency funding, um, emergency declaration funding, or other means. And, and, and that's what we're doing right now. That is not a resilient response to this crisis, but but I think there are very good options out there. But nothing is free. Yeah, I I think of um, something called the coast theorem, and and a lot of uh, Coasian concepts are in law and economics there, and they say you got to get the incentives right to make sure that the the tort feeder, the person who causes the damage. Get, does the right thing, but but people have optimal protection against the damages. When it seems to me, when we're talking about all what the utility should do, without asking about the incentives for optimal protection from it, we're forgetting all the lessons from Coase. Now that maybe maybe some of you may not love Coase as much as I do, but uh, how do you respond to that? So, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that um, one, of, one of the things that is a real challenge, if you look through the literature, and I, I will, I'm going to tell you a lot about disaster relief literature, and then I'm going to, but I'm caveat it first by saying, the wildfire risks in California, I think, are now so real and so present for people that while I'm telling you is what is true and established in academia, it might not be true here any longer, which is potentially really exciting for disaster policy. But fundamentally, people are really bad at understanding risk. Right? If you look at what happens after hurricanes, people who actually experience the hurricane tend to leave. Their houses get bought, and they don't get bought at a reduced value. We're only just now starting to see in certain parts of Miami real estate values decline because of sea level rise. People perceive natural hazard risks as things that don't happen to them, or they happen once. They say, oh, that was the one in 500 year event. I'm not going to live another 500 years, so I'll be fine. So. That means that it is politically really difficult, especially before disaster events, to go in and talk to people about restructuring communities and even about simple things like risk mitigation. There's a paper by a guy at Penn, Howard Kuhnry, they're a very famous paper, about California earthquake insurance, where he basically showed that people will not go buy a roll of duct tape and duct tape their water heater to a supporting structure in the home, which will prevent thousands of dollars in damage during an earthquake and it will reduce your premium substantially, but they just don't think it's going to happen, so they don't go buy the roll of duct tape, right? And so I, I think that um, when you think about uh, the behavioral economics aspects of how individuals perceive and respond to and mitigate risks, people will tend to systematically under-mitigate, and so then it becomes a question of how localities can start to think about incentivizing risk mitigating behaviors. And we do have some examples of that in other places. The community rating system and the National Flood Insurance Program is one of them. And under that program, what happens is if communities adopt certain community-wide risk reduction measures, typically in the form of zoning ordinances, you know, you have to elevate your home or you know you can't build within a certain number of feet of the floodplain, the whole community gets lower flood insurance premiums 
generally the uptake of those things has been much, much, much less than what classical economics would predict. That we generally find that it is politically so difficult to address these things that people are not responding to traditional economic incentives. And I think that in this context that's really challenging both for communities and for the investor-owned utilities. Because I think when communities really want to try to do things to restructure in advance of a fire event, it can be tricky to figure out where you're going to get the money from and convince people they ought to spend it or that they ought to cut down that big old tree they really, really love because it's resting on a power line. And from the utility perspective, I think one of the things that's really challenging as we start to think about climate risk, and, and it's not true not just of wildfires, but of all natural hazards, because utilities are obligated to serve anybody who builds in their service territory, right now, if you're running a utility company, you are your climate risk is entirely dependent upon the land use territory of the government, the land use policies of the governments whose territory you serve, which essentially means you have absolutely no ability to control your natural hazard risk in a broad brush way. Now there are things you can do, you can harden, you can underground all of those things, but it is there is a component of that risk and that hazard exposure that lies completely in the hands of the local government and that it's hard to influence. Okay, let me suddenly change. <laughs> From, okay, we've been talking about background and big concepts, but um, recently um, the wildlife commission, the wildfire commission, whatever the long name is, recently finalized its recommendations. I think it was yesterday, uh, and you're a member of that committee. What can you tell us about what the recommendations were publicly of that that commission? Just briefly, because many of us have not many of the audience and may not have read all the conclusions of your of your recommendation that you're making I understand to the governor and to the legislature why don't you tell us a little bit about what you sure. what your commission is recommending so so to start you know we're we're in a pretty narrow lane we've been talking in this in our conversation today about mostly about mitigation what can we do to lower the risk um, the commission's role was to think about how to socialize the costs from these disasters moving forward in a way that was better for California than what we're currently doing. And we made recommendations in sort of three silos. One was uh, recommendations about re potentially reforming the inverse condemnation doctrine and an and, and avenue for approaching that issue. Um, I would say that that's unlikely to happen but we felt it was important to at least discuss it and, and, and mention, you know, one approach to that, that would we think would be a better outcome, moving in the direction of sort of a negligence standard. Um, the second piece of what we did was to, to make recommendation a recommendation to create essentially a, a risk pooling mechanism for the entire state's utility system, right? A, a, a wildfire, what we call a wildfire victims fund, but basically a gigantic insurance policy that would cover losses from the uh, from these these catastrophic wildfires that are utility cost mm -hmm. and and we spent a lot of time thinking about moral hazard in that context how to avoid just cutting big checks for utilities that do bad things um, but 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 we we concluded and and this this chapter was actually authored by myself and Carla Peterman a former commissioner um, that that it was in the interest of the state to make that investment. Um, we recommended at the same time changes to cost recovery, uh, some of the issues that, that, that Maggie has, has brought up this morning about, and, and I've discussed about the sort of uncertainty around whether costs would be passed through, and basically said if the utilities make their own contribution, if shareholders of utilities contribute to the creation of this insurance policy, essentially if they buy, pay their part of the insurance premium and rate payers pay their part of the insurance premium, then the utility should be protected to a greater degree from the costs of these fires. The last part of the recommendations were some, some pretty detailed kind of technical tweaks to um, how home insurance works. And anybody who lives in high wildfire risk areas in, the, in California probably has, has experienced or is experienced or has neighbors that have experienced the strain that the home insurance market is under. And, and I co-wrote a chapter of the report with former insurance commissioner Dave Jones um, on those issues and sort of how to think about them and some modest tweaks to make now. We view the situation in the home insurance market as fragile but not a crisis. 
but it's fragile. And there are steps we can take to kind of stabilize the situation to some degree, to hopefully avoid a crisis. Maggie, what do you think of those recommendations? Uh, understanding that he just set you up by saying, and I authored these various steps. <laughs> Now, look, 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 and then try to abstract from that anyway. <laughs> no, I, I think, um, you know, the utilities were all very involved in, in commenting in the process. And I think the commission is to be commended for recognizing the need to stabilize the, the to reassure the financial markets and provide a stable situation for the utilities so that the utilities can continue to play their role in doing all the really important things that California wants to do on climate change, right? If you don't have financially solvent utilities, it's hard to do those. I think the commission had a very hard task to do in terms of thinking about balancing and the equities and where do the incentives lie. And I think they did a very admirable job at that. I will say, uh, you know, speaking on behalf of the utilities, there's certainly a good bit of controversy about the level of shareholder contribution and whether that's something that they are willing to stomach. Um, you know, to my mind, I think the real question is not – how good of a job did the commission do? But what is the legislature going to do with that? Right? I think the commission put quite a few things on the table that in whole could do a lot to both reduce the scope of those liabilities and mitigate risk on a going forward basis. But you know, there are many pieces of that that you could enact enough pieces of it to really make a meaningful difference, both in terms of risk exposure and st financial stability of the utilities. It's just not clear to me what's going to happen with that over the next month or two politically. It, it it seems to me that, um, as you said, you stayed in, in a, well, it's not that narrow a lane, but there's a lot of things you didn't deal with in the commission. And it seems to me that there may be a bit of a trade-off between the clean energy goals that the state has articulated and the um, wildfire risk. Uh, what I have in mind is if you do a lot of uh, solar systems, um, utility scale, you may do it a long ways away from people where people are, are using their electricity. Um, if, you, uh, if you shut down the, the, the depower electricity lines every so often, then people may get gas fire generator or diesel generators in their home. Uh, can you comment, some of you comment on the trade-offs between the clean energy goals and the wildfire mitigation goals that we have? I think there's a huge trade-off to be made. If we don't solve this problem, we're not going to achieve the climate goals. I mean, it's really, the, the basic strategy for achieving our climate goals is build an incredibly clean electricity system and then electrify everything in the state, cars and buildings especially. Maybe we'll deal with industry at the end. That's the hard, that's really the hardest part. But electrifying everything, building all that clean energy production and the storage, the energy storage is going to be required to balance load both on a short and long term basis is not a cheap proposition. It is one thing to put that on the equivalent of a 30 year mortgage, it is quite another to go to put it on your credit card or go to a payday lender. And we are in payday lender land in California right now. The utilities recently asked for a cost of capital increase to 17%. That's, it's, it's hard to, for those of you who don't like get into the wonkery of utility rate making, that may not sound like a lot, but it's sort of like saying this is no longer a utility business anymore, right? We're in a different world when it comes to, and, and of course they won't get 17%, they'll get something less than that. That's their opening offer and, you know, and a former commissioner who I know, you know, would always say, just divide by two, whatever they ask for. Um, and she was kidding, but whatever. It's, there's something to that. Um, and Mike, you'd say that. And, yeah, I'm looking around the room. My employer may say that, but, uh, but, but, so, but so, I shouldn't there interview. is an enormous trade-off here because we simply we have to keep rates affordable. The other challenge that we haven't talked about is that it is you know California has high electricity rates. Those are affordable in places like here that have relatively equable climates. But when you go to Bakersfield and it's 120 degrees every day in the summer and you have to run your air conditioner in order to avoid you know, heat illness in your house, it is not easy to afford what California is doing. And if we make it a lot harder, it's, it's, just, it's just not something that's going to happen. There's not political space in rates. And the things that will be cut are the climate and energy goals. Those are the luxury goods that California has been able to afford 
because we've managed this kind of careful evolution in dance, and there's so many people in this room, I'm looking around, that have been a part of that evolution and keeping the train on the tracks. But we're, we're off the tracks right now. And if we can't get back on and can't get these costs under control, we just can't afford it. It's just not going to happen, this would be my view. We have a raised hand in the Anybody's audience. Thoughts? I don't know if you want to open it up. But, um. you know, well, I'm going to open it up <clears throat> okay. in just a minute. I want to just have a couple quick questions, and then I will open up for questions from the, from the audience um, with question marks at the end. Uh, you mentioned the financial markets, what's happening and the utilities asking for. Are there any other lessons that we get loud and clear from any other financial markets that are out there right now? You mentioned the insurance markets too. Do, is there something that the financial markets are telling us that um, UCOS said that some of the reductions are overreaction, which means you believe your judgment's better than that of all the investors, but... What can you say about uh, uh, the financial markets, what they're telling us? So, you know, from my perspective, I think one of the, the most significant facts in thinking about where California's utilities are financially is that um, CalPERS has gotten out of them all, right? That the, the state entities that are charged with managing the retirement funds of state employees no longer invest in the state's utilities. And that is a really big deal. Utilities are traditionally considered to be incredibly safe stocks. They are dividend stocks. They are really stable. And you know, so to be a retirement fund and not be in your own state's dividend stocks says a lot about not just what credit rating agencies think, not you know what hedge fund people think, but what real investors think about what's going on with the utilities. Um, you know, so I, I think that that suggests a crisis of confidence. Um, you know, it was a very strong reaction to a single set of decisions, but I do think that part of that was because we didn't move quickly to fix the policy problem, right? Yeah. The California Supreme Court got asked on two separate occasions to go in and overrule Barham, which is the decision that created the inverse condemnation. You know, and I think that the markets also saw SB 901 is not going far enough. If you look at any of the credit ratings that are out there right now, they basically said, the policy market in California is way too volatile right now. If the state doesn't act to fix it before the 2019 fire situation kicks off, we expect to downgrade everybody again. Um, and I don't think those are inappropriate reactions given that you see what's happened with PG&E and you think about the possibility of giant runaway exposures. You know, Because if you really think that your wildfire exposure is somewhere in the neighborhood of 7 to $10 billion and you can buy one and a half billion dollars of coverage, and it's really hard to place, as the other credit piece, really hard to place alternative forms, right? It's very hard to place cat bonds right now. It's really hard to get other kinds of insurance. It, it becomes really hard to see how investors create a thesis to infuse long-term capital into that system. Okay, there's more expertise in the audience than I have, so let's turn the questions to to expertise, and co please go up to the microphone, and, and and this way I don't have to make any decisions, it's whoever's next in line, but but no long speeches. Alan, yeah, and Alan, like you and everybody else, uh, identify who you are. Uh, thank you, Jim, I want to uh, thank you to the panel. Identify yourself. Uh, sorry, I'm Alan Sandstead from uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. Uh, thank you for an excellent discussion. I want to uh, shift and have a, ask a question about the cost-benefit analysis of, why, of uh, prevention on the part of utilities. So as you may know, the PUC has, oversee has overseen a very long involved process to develop risk management systems and tools, which are now being implemented in the wire fire, wildfire uh, prevention plans. Uh, but they, the, they essentially said, um, the staff, their staff wrote a report uh, recently, said this, you know, there's no way of monetizing the benefits of these preventive investments because the risks are just so huge. Uh, Florida has recently done something similar with respect to hurricanes. So my question is, can you say something about the, you know, what you think is the, even the conceptual possibility of actually monetizing the benefits of preventive investments, hardening, undergrounding, whatever, in a way that um, they could be, the, the, the utilities could undertake actual cost benefit analysis with risk? Either. I, I think I, 
I wouldn't agree with the characterization that it's impossible to quantify the risk mitigation. I, I, that's benefits. not mine. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I just think I think there's clearly more work to be done on that front, and the decision on the general guidance on the wildfire mitigation plans uh, says as much, right? And some utilities clearly, from what they're saying in their wildfire mitigation plans, have done risk modeling. My sense is that you know that, that would be more typical of a large corporation that has something that can blow up and kill a lot of people, right? And, and I think, I think there are companies know how to do that. They know how to measure and reduce variance in operation of their systems. And that's exactly the kind of problem we're talking about here. And- Sorry, sorry a, to interrupt, just to be clear. Yeah. They are doing risk management, they are doing that. That's not the issue. The issue is the monetization of the benefits and investments in mm -hmm. terms of avoided fires and the avoided costs. Yeah, so I, I think it's possible to quantify the risk buy down, right? And, and, the, and the degree to which a particular event reduces risk. I think there are ways to get at that number um, that you know might actually coexist alongside uh, some sort of a wildfire fund. For example, if utilities have to go into the market and buy uh, a small fraction of the kind of higher tiers of risk in, a, in an insurance tower, you can quantify what the risk buy-down is. And we're still learning a lot about how big this risk is and what to do. But, but I, I guess I would say there's a lot of science that can be done on this question and that has not yet been done. And there's a lot to learn. There's also a lot of big data kind of analytics that's coming into the space that I think is going to, over the next couple of years, really improve our, our understanding of the risk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Melissa. Good morning. I'm Melissa McKeith. I'm the woman with the Doberman who's been growling under his breath a little bit at this panel because uh, he thinks the tail is wagging the dog when we're always talking about how to offset and readjust liability and costs after the fact. Um, as Jim knows, 20 years ago, my family started a nonprofit just dealing with urban forest interface and development. And I'm delighted that 20 years later, people are finally talking about it. And um, Montecito is a great example. So I worked closely with the LA Times on exposing how this was less Southern California Edison and more poor planning, debris basins overflowing. And by the way, it cost almost a half a billion dollars to clean Pacific Coast Highway. And my guess is that you and I and everybody in this room are paying. So uh, two questions. One is, could we communicate risk better? You talk about a 100-year flood, a 200-year flood. That's really a 1% likelihood of an event occurring. If I knew I was going to get on a plane and there was a 1% chance that plane was going down, I wouldn't get on the plane. And most people, they hear 100 years, 500 years, and they think it won't happen in their lifetime. So I'd like to know if your report dealt with any of that. And secondly, on land use planning at the local level, the third grail of everything, um, the problem is not the utilities, at least, and I don't represent utilities. That's not where the issue is. The, f the problem is that we're putting people in harm's way because it's economically a good thing for a lot of developers. We don't like to talk about it, but um, in Montecito, the county and city officials are being sued. Um, and at some point, they're going to get sued in terms of their personal liability for making decisions that ultimately result in people's deaths. And I'd like to know whether you guys addressed any of that kind of accountability at the local level so that we're dealing with things before the fire, before the storm, not deterring people, not after the fact. And I'm sorry it's a speech, Jim. Yeah, well, that, that's okay, but... By the way, no I, almost got, I almost got on the commission, and my, my mom said, and I listened to her, she goes, everyone will hate you, both sides of the issue, because it's so <laughs> controversial. So. And can we answer that, not just in terms yeah, of what the commission did, but yeah. in terms of the ideas out there, because it's, it, it's really much more general than just the commission. So you two decide. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll just say the first thing that I always say when I, and I didn't get it, well, I think I said it before we even talked about the commission this morning. The most important thing that California can do is lower the risk, not figure out how to socialize it better. And that, that means land use, it means fuels management, and it means home hardening, right? And those are the three legs of the stool, and there is just no way around that. And I agree with you that there needs to be greater accountability to, for local governments that effectively are external, externalizing 
their costs onto the state, both through CAL FIRE emergency response and then through the, you know, the rebuilding costs that are that are passed through. And that's that is a hard thing to do. It's especially hard to do in the midst of a terrible housing crisis in the state. I would say that I am encouraged by moves that are occurring in the legislature with respect to this. It's 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 there's more movement. This there's much more active discussion of the land use question this year than there was last year, and I'm hopeful, not optimistic, but I'm, I'm hopeful. So I think that the point that you raised about developers and their time horizons is a really important one because I, I, you know, just putting my lawyer hat on, one of the things that really drives local land use decision making, in addition to the fact that they can externalize all these costs, is the takings doctrine, right? California has had a bunch of cases go all the way up to the Supreme Court where land use planning authorities have tried to tell people they can't build in certain places because of hazards they face. And generally, um, it's really hard to do that. You can structure how they develop, right? You can exact fees from them to create better wildfire mitigation, right? So you could do things like say, well, gosh, if you're going to build in the WUI, you have to underground, and we don't want you just pay for the undergrounding, the distribution system in your community. We think maybe you need to pay the millions of dollars a mile to underground the transmission that gets there. So you can think about ways that there are things you can do within the legal constraints that fall on land use planning authorities that would hopefully better reflect the true costs of building in those areas. But there, there are some real legal and political constraints that I think do, do make that more difficult than one might hope. Uh, Jeff Alfson with Peninsula Clean Energy and the town of Portola Valley. So we're a local land use authority that's bumped up against that exact question you just experienced. I have a different question though, which is um, we talked a lot about incentives, uh, incentives in, and safety. And my question is, do you see differences in behavior between IOUs and munis? So do you see differences in behavior in terms of line safety and, and such between for-profit and non-profit entities? So I would say... I wouldn't necessarily draw the line that way. I think fundamentally the IOUs have a much bigger bite of the transmission system than the POUs do, so they have a much bigger piece of the risk, right? Because mo most of the risk is the fire risk is really coming from those long transmission lines. Um, but you know, I think my experience in interacting with the utilities out here has been that they're all, they're all you know serious about this risk and trying to address it. And I, I have not personally noticed any difference between the two. I don't know. I, I think there are differences across institutions, right? And so certainly there's a contrast to be drawn between San Diego and the other two investor-owned utilities. I think LA, uh, Department of Water and Power, has done a better job perhaps than the IOUs in terms of system hardening, and they've built rate players for that over time. Um, the smaller municipals in Northern California are under tremendous strain right now. They basically, they can't buy insurance, right? So they're, they're self-insuring. And um, some of them have done things, you know, one municipal that we heard from on the commission just gave generators to everyone in the tier three wildfire area so that they could turn the power off more easily. And they only had a couple hundred customers to do that to, you know, out of 8,000 total customers. This is a small operation. But, you know, I think, I think there, are, there are different experiments that are happening I would agree with with Maggie's statement that everyone is concerned with reducing this risk. You know, this is a the one thing to say about this issue is the interests are aligned, right? Shareholders do not want to have a fire because that is a disaster if you're a shareholder, just as it is as a disaster if you're a ratepayer or if you are, you know, for a muni or an investor owned. And we want to go move pretty quickly now because we're running out of time. We may extend it maybe one or two minutes beyond it, but it's it's getting in the way of lunch. So if <laughs> if, if we extend it more than a couple of minutes, yes. Okay. Mark, you. All right. So got to identify yourself, though. Mark Roost. I'm with Sustainable Clean Energy a Battery Startup. I'm also involved in a bunch of other businesses, and I'm also involved in activism, supporting Peninsula Clean Energy and things like that. Uh, so we don't actually need to put in singly large infrastructure. We should, not just can, do smart microgrids, lots of solar, battery storage, and fire-resistant construction, which means ultra-performance cement, which is just barely getting started into the United States now. And, uh, and the degree of savings for consumers is switching all energy to local energy and energy efficiency is the greatest good for the greatest number. So 
if you look at it from a whole systems perspective, instead of from the silos, even what you're talking about is still silos from my point of view, because we, the tribes can organize thinning the forests first mechanically and then re reintroducing fire as the Karak cultural fire people or Europe cultural fire people are talking about. Um, we can do that and by using, you know, you know, we can turn that into fuel, into actually chemical feedstocks or fuel, and we can turn it into biochar and things. So there's a whole lot more. I won't do it right now, but Mark, I want you are you interested in doing that? Yeah, so there, there's my question is, would you consider that, and can we all talk more about it later? I'd just say that I think these fires raise a really important question about the locational value of distributed storage. And um, that, you know, it, this is a special application where there is enormous locational value that might not exist, you know, on Stanford campus. But when you go up on the hill, up by Skyline, the ability of the companies to turn the power off when it's dangerous is incredibly valuable. And I think there's a public interest in facilitating that action right now. So, under $100 yeah. Hi, I'm Pat Showalter, and I'm a former mayor of Mountain View, California. And um, you've mentioned the importance of local land use decisions. Just in um, the Bay Area, we have over a hundred um, cities and towns that are all uh, served by from five to seven, maybe nine uh, city council people. And most of those people, you know, are are really good right, well-thinking people, but they're not fire experts. So what I would say to you is they need to become fire experts, and they need to understand what are the good um, practices that need to be done to make their communities resilient for fires. How are you going to educate those local officials? And keep in mind that it is a rolling group of people. People are in, are in office for from two to eight years, and then they move on. Thank you. Okay, and and the, yours is the next to the last question. Let I'll let you guys try to respond to that one. Although that, to a large extent, was a statement as well as a question, and which I appreciate that it was, a, it was a very valuable statement. So you can answer it or not answer it up to you. I think there's a role for the state in both um, funding and uh, supporting the education efforts at the local level. And, you know, one of the best illustrations for this, the state put up $200 million of greenhouse gas reduction funds last year to help reduce fuels. And one of the biggest challenges is just getting the money out the door because there are not people at the local level that have time to write grant applications, right? You know, the, the, the level of community kind of volunteer organizing that's required to get this stuff done in communities is, is too hard. Right now, and I think there's a real role for the state to fund, you know, FTEs in local governments. That's a fire prevention person that could then educate the leadership when these big land use decisions come up, but also walk door to door and knock on people's doors, get to know the community, and and help to educate homeowners so that there's less political resistance when hard decisions come before a planning commission or. The, the, the county council or whoever has to make these decisions. And, and, I, and we're not doing that, and we need to. I completely agree. I think there's also an important role for the private sector to play, right? I think to the extent that the investor-owned utilities really want to continue to be able to be part of communities, they need to be engaging with the communities and helping communities think more broadly about their, their fire resilience and what kinds of measures they can be engaging in in partnership to reduce risk and to build capacity. Right. I want to... Before we have the last question, which this is, I want to remind people we're into, we're supposed to be ended, so nobody's impolite if they want to leave now because there's lunch. Uh, lunch will happen until 1 o'clock the, when the debate begins. Okay, last question. Hi, I'm Max Henry from Lumina Decision Systems. Um, you know, we don't have a representative from a utility here, but I, obviously, you know, some mistakes were made, let's say, in the past, how good a job do you think they're doing right now in terms of mitigating the fire risks to the best that they can? Do either of you want to take that <laughs> on? <or not? laughs> I, they, they both are lawyers, so yeah, you got to be We only have half a minute left, of course, yeah, yes. So I understand this might not be the 
I think I, I would just underscore something that, that Michael said earlier, and that is, you know, this is an existential threat to the utilities and to their business. They are taking this incredibly seriously, and I think they are looking at all kinds of approaches to try to mitigate fire risk. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would agree with what, what Maggie said, and, and I think the problem we face is that there's not, you know, ideally, there, there are a set of things utilities would like to do. Some of them are probably cost effective. Some of them are, you know, gold plating the system, but that will reduce fire risk. But they take time and, you know, probably a decade, right, because of the limitations on uh, skilled uh, skilled uh, electrical line workers and skilled tree trimmers even. And so in the meantime, what do we do? Right, and we cannot live through a decade like the last two years. There won't be investor-owned. There won't be investors in investor-owned utilities anymore. Not even the hedge funds that own them now, and and um, the state will just can't. We can't tolerate more paradises. It's just not acceptable. And so there's a very difficult transition period that we're going to be going through for the next couple of years. Hopefully, we can manage the politics of that. Turning off the power is not convenient. It's even dangerous. Um, but it also creates a lot of safety. And, and finding that sweet spot is really tough. Right. I want to thank both of you. Uh, I want to thank especially Maggie, who, who flew from D.C. in order to be with us today. Um, Michael, Mike um, drove from San Francisco, so that doesn't <laughs> quite count the same thing. But I want to thank you both. Very, very enlightening time.